Welcome to Breaking Banks. It's easy to say that there are populations left behind because of product market fit or the company didn't align culturally. You know, it, Alex Johnson and I picked this up at the uh, live version of Hot Wings and Hot Takes at Move Spintech DevCon, where I you know, really wanted to dig in and also did this, I guess, on stage for DevCon is affinity is not just it is a bank or a product created by people who look like me or identify like me, right? Like that is a feeling and you have to, you know, it's more than a feeling we talk about solving some of these. So I want to start with something I don't think we talk about enough. There is a significant population that is opted out of the, the system. And Stephen, let's start with you. Is opting out a significant factor when you look at the problem that Obsidian is going to go solve for in the underserved parts of the Black community? Or did they just never opt in? Or is it both? I say it's a little bit of both. And uh, that's a great question. We, um, we, we focus so much on like financial literacy when we always talk about serving the, the un unbanked and underbanked. But I don't think we talk about the trust as much. And like so many people in our community um, have either opted out or never opted in um, because of that lack of trust. Sometimes it's, it's generational and it's been passed down. So I know me and Damon talk about a lot. We're one generation removed from people who genuinely didn't trust the banks, didn't trust the American financial system. Um, and because of that lack of trust, was never really able to participate and benefit from it. Um, so yeah, that it, it's a little bit of both. I'll let Damon add anything if he wants to. So I do want to say is that while we are one generation removed from people that weren't banked, two generations ago, our grandparents were banked. At that time, we had postal banking. There was a bank in all of the neighborhood. You could go, you can get checks. You can go and get an account. You had the ability to transfer money. You had the ability to use money. And that went away in about the 70s. And we have slowly see, seen all of our neighborhoods become these bank deserts. And it's in some ways us not opting in but it's also the, the appearance of it. So if you go to a bank in Detroit, you're going to be guarded or greeted by someone with a gun. At an armed door, you have to get buzzed in. You walk in, you will see no tellers at the tables willing to give you loans. There are only tellers at the desk willing to give you money and take your money. You go into a bank in, the, you know, in a different neighborhood, you will see people there that can do a car loan or auto loan. So while it, there is an aspect, aspect of us not opting in, but I never felt invited into the banking system before. And I think that's the, the biggest disconnect. Well, and you know, let's build on that invitation. I want to hit on this banking deserts piece because how come we're not seeing the move to digital within the banking, the black banking community? So um, while the digital banking um, situation is good, a lot of those are prepaid cards. So you're still gate kept from a lot of situations where you would need to debit card for say a car rental or some of the other aspects. So even if you have a digital bank, you're still you know, under bank, you're not able to get a car, you know, a car loan through an auto loan through a bank like Chime. So the digital banking is getting us some of the access to get our paychecks and some of our money, but it's still gatekeeping us out of the traditional experiences of banking. Amber, same question to you. And you know, said it half jokingly, but it's so true. It's like, you know, why doesn't the native population trust the white man? It's like you know, it's just so apparent in some cases. Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> but it also, you know, if you look at how, you know, the res reservation system works and the strength of tribe, I also would have thought that like at a, you know, tribal level, this could have been been solved, but it hasn't. So talk to us about the opt-in versus the opting out of the system when it comes to the indigenous people in the United States. Yeah, I think a lot of our folks never opted in. Um and that is for a lot of the same reasons that Damon and Stephen have been talking about. There's just an inherent distrust of the government, the financial system, and we haven't historically been treated well by it or invited in, as you said. And something else that I think I've talked to you guys about in the past, Stephen, I know I've heard you talk about this, like in your neighborhood, when you're walking around, there's plenty of check cashing places. 
but not a lot of actual banks. And that's very true, particularly in reservations. Um, Native Americans travel three times further than the average American to access a bank. And so having a mobile first solution is super important for our population. Um, but but it's interesting because you'll if you ever go to a reservation, a lot of times uh, right around the outside of that area, you will find just check cashing place after check cashing place just completely surrounding um, the area. Yeah. Um, you know, the folks at Sunrise Bank, David Ryling has brought this up on the Next Gen Banker podcast and told me part of the story. And so they happen to be down the street um, you know, from me here in the Twin Cities, but the area they were uh, in when he left to go live in Southern California, still not sure why he decided to move back to take over. Um, the bank, but it was a historically blue collar white neighborhood. And when he came back to become CEO of Sunrise Banks, he realized the entire neighborhood that Sunrise Banks served had completely changed. It actually is home to the largest Hmong population outside of Vietnam and a good number of Somali immigrants, right? And one of the first things he did was he said, our front lines need to look like and talk like the people we serve. Uh, as part of it. And Damon, I think you hit part of this. I had never you know, really thought about how, you know, if I am, you know, someone that is going into a bank and there is an armed guard looking at me suspiciously from the, the moment I'm, you know, approaching a block away, that probably changes my demeanor of going into the bank, right? Uh, the, like the, there, there is it's not so subtle of a mind shift in, in terms of like what that emotional experience becomes. And so I think, Sunrise did a good job of changing what it looks like. They also uh, got into the check cashing business almost as a front to their bank to kind of pull you in through the lobby. But I'm curious, how do we begin to change it? Because I think just changing the, the color of the producers isn't enough. Like, Damon, why don't we start with you? How do we begin to crack you know, this invitation that it feels inviting and inclusive? I really think it it has to start with trust. And I don't really want to harp on the trust aspect, but there's only so many big companies with the money to, you know, finance the rebuilding of a black community. Um, it has to come from some of the major banks, some of the major head funds. Some of the same people that are profiting off of us being in this situation have to be willing to help us. And they have to see the, the end goal here. We're going to be able to buy a house one day if you can help us today. We're going to be able to give you all of that interest on that house. We're going to be able to give you all that interest on the car if you work with us today. And that's kind of where we have to have some of the major corporations have that long-term view, that we can turn this 42% underbanked population into about a 14%, because that's about you know, where white Americans are in America. And you can get them access to home loans and car loans. And you would stop seeing them as such a, a, a pain to have and be excited to have Black customers join your bank. And that's kind of where I think it has to go, is just that excitement and that invitation there. Amber, from your perspective, you know, looking native, is it a different approach or how do we begin to you know, pull people in that historically have both felt mistreated and misaligned by the system? I mean, I completely agree with Damon. It's all about trust. Um, you know, I think I've talked about this on the show before, but we, in our early concept test, it was interesting because we were trying to test all of these account features, like no fees and a a spot me feature and a credit builder. And those were all great. People were really excited about them. But the number of one piece of feedback that we got was this FUBU idea, right? It's for us, it's by us. We know that we're working with a bank that's not funding pipelines and uh, other projects that are, um, you know, very much go against our traditional values. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's really important. But then once you have people in the door, you have to offer something that is unique, tailored, special, uh, inclusive, thoughtful. And that's where the hard work of FinTech I think is. And it's also the, the golden opportunity that FinTech has because we are able to be really flexible and create products that a typical community bank that's gotta be for everyone all the time maybe doesn't have the bandwidth to do. Yeah. Steven, I, did you have? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I think, because I, I think the, the native or indigenous community as well as the black community share a lot of Pause for a second. Steven, you're breaking up, so just hold I your thought for a second. With and mistrust of the financial hey, Steven, and Steven, can you start over? You broke up right there.
Okay, so, uh, I was just saying, as well as the Black community, we share a lot of the same issues and, and mistrust of the financial system. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, but maybe start over one more time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. As the Black uh, community. I think, <laughs> right. I think the Black community, as well as the Native or Indigenous community, shares a lot of the same mistrust and issues with the financial system. And I think as we move further and further into this digital age, we're going to see like customer service be a lot of self-service and the areas that these institutions can really really harp on is the customer engagement and having these like specialized offerings me and Demond talk about um a lot we want to offer african-american vernacular english like as an option um when you're transacting business with the city and like some people might think it's just to be cool but one of the main things that keeps a lot of our underbanked population out of these institutions it's feeling like they have to go in there and code switch and be somewhere, someone they're not just to even have a chance at getting a loan or even opening up an account. I mean, I, that's such an important point, right? That, you, you know, it starts with, we talked about the initiative by the FDIC to even humanize the legalese that sits in, you know, most terms and conditions, but it still is a very whitewashed and a, you know, certain approach to language that would keep people out. And again, demand to build on your point, things that make you feel like you don't belong here, even go to the language. When it and it's all of those, it's all of those tiny choices that we have to make as founders. That is <laughs> it's actually incredible just the volume of decisions that I feel like I'm making on a day-to-day -day basis about things like that. I remember we had a, a really long discussion about what we want to call our customer service agents, for example, because some people call them like helpers or advisors. And it's like, you have to like toe this weird line between being clear about what this is, but also using language that your people will identify with and, and get immediately. And so it's just like, yeah, there's so many places in an app and a digital experience where you have a you have a chance to make someone feel either very welcome and seen or very alienated. Um, and we're just, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm making a million decisions a day that are just so tiny like that, but are big. Well, but probably no single decision kills you, but in totality, each one of those decisions culminates in something that could could be very different in terms of this level of inclusivity that says I belong. I, mean, I wanna add one example of a story that actually just came out this week, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, there was a, a, a older woman, um, I believe she was a senior citizen here in Detroit, and she hit a jackpot at one of our casinos, got a check, went to a bank to go um, try to I think either cash the check or, or just open up an account to deposit it. And they literally um, thought it was fraudulent. Like they just didn't believe that she hit a jackpot at the casino. Um, I actually believe they ended up calling law enforcement on her. And it's little things like that, that this elderly woman is now probably going to have to go pay a fee at some check cash in place to even, you know, get the money. But then when she goes home and back to her community and friends, she's going to be bad mouthing these institutions. So that, that could be two to three generations just from one bad example that lose trust in this system because someone that they love dearly was mistreated by it. And we see so many examples of that. Now, I, I would only disagree with one point of that, which is that was not something minor, right? Because I guarantee if I walked in as, you know, a white male with that, you know, into a bank branch, I would not have been treated like that. Right. And it, it's messed up to say this, that's why a lot of us will go to, you know, a check cash and spot or a payday lender because you actually get treated better when you walk. <laughs> yeah. No, it's in, yeah, it's important to note, right? And then that is generationally what is passed down. Devon? I just want to, I just want to like butt in that. I don't think Steven is really like exploring the problem of payday lenders in Detroit. If you walk into our most famous sub shop in Detroit, it's called Tubbies. Outside of every Tubbies right now, they say payday loans available. Like, they're everywhere. They're inside of our gas stations. They're inside of our restaurants right now. It is so predatory. We were actually in Atlanta for a business conference um, about a week and a half ago. Uh, we saw one of the bigger banks. Uh, I'm not going to mention them by name, but Stephen and I had mentioned to each other that we had never seen this bank in our lives. 
we live in Detroit, and we had never actually physically seen what it looked like. And that blew our mind. Mm. Yeah. Imagine. So, I mean, Amber knows this going through the Alloy Labs investment process where Sam and I hammered on her that it isn't just about the uh, affinity. That is important. I think a lot of this of what you described, the way it probably manifests itself is in acquisition, right? If I don't, I either never get into the pipeline because I don't want to opt into it or I had fall out of it somewhere because it doesn't feel like I belong here. I think uh, you all have done a great job of talking about that, but you have to find a way to you know, translate this improved trust into the three variables to make the model work, either the cost of, activa- uh, cost of acquisition, the activation rate, or the lifetime value. Amber, like, what, let's start with you. Let's talk about how we take you know, our focus on a very specific community and how do we drive and use our go-to-market strategy to impact cost of acquisition and you know, its twin sister, the activation rate. For us at Totem, uh, we have a really helpful infrastructure built into our tribal communities, which is that we have actual tribes that are sovereign governments that provide benefits to our people and and help them in any number of ways and our community organizers, community leaders. Um, And so for us, our acquisition model is greatly discounted compared to some other folks that have to just go direct to consumer because we're able to partner with tribes as intermediaries to carry our product to their communities and um and really talk about talk about talk about banking in context of the other things that are going on within the tribes, whether that is knowing about what events are going on or accessing your tribal benefits, which are cash payments that a lot of folks get. And so, you know, we're fortunate that we have a really sticky way to get to our people because it's not just us out there. We have these amazing partners in, in the form of, of tribes. And then, um, Yeah, I would just say that like that go to market looks very different when we're looking at the segment of our population that is not well connected to a tribe. So for example, you know, there are a lot of folks that are self-identifying as Native American on the census. Between 2010 and 2020, our population grew 160%. And most of that was people self-identifying as Native that did not before. Um, Obviously, we have a little bit different situation than other demographics because it's easier to do that um, for us. But for those folks, they have Native heritage. They just can't always prove it. And so for those folks that don't have a tribe that they're affiliated with, how do we reach them? And so that's where it becomes a little bit challenging because like these guys know, I think you have to be, our culture is very much one where you have to be present in order to get that trust. You have to have boots on the ground, you have to be there. And so we have a really grassroots strategy um, that is focused on, you know, being at powwows, being at, you know, uh, community events, being at uh, cultural meetings, all of these other things where we can be seen and people know that we're real and that we are a part of the community. Um, And that's something that is a little bit difficult to explain to investors sometimes um, because they are used to seeing different models that are all based on like SEO and pay-per-click and these things. Those things don't really work well for our community. And I have a feeling you guys at Obsidian feel the same way. (laughs) Heads are nodding for those (laughs) listening rather than watching this. We 100% agree. Um, that's why we we actually chose a very old school analog approach that's been proven time and time again to work in our communities, um, which is the door to door. A lot of times with community banking, the bank will come before the community. And when you think about just the word, you know, community, common unity, um, like going door to door, if, if nothing else, it allows everyone to, like you say, see you out there, see you be present. See, you, man, you, you have to be genuine in these communities. If you come to someone's door looking like a salesman, you know, coming with some gimmick, you're probably going to get ran off the block. And so, like, that that genuinely can make the difference um, in, in, you know, acquiring some of these customers. And uh, just to expand on what he said, a lot of our go-to-market strategy is building personal relationships with everyone we meet. As we're going door-to-door, we're going to, t- you know, 10 of the most busy populated cities. So, a lot of our neighborhoods are really good dense. We live in a lot of apartments, a lot of situations like that. So we're gonna be able to quickly you know, meet a lot of people and we wanna host events while we're doing this. My dad is a mechanic. Learn how to change your tires, learn how to change your brakes. Those are quick, easy fixes. Learn how to check your oils. 
we really want to go and we want to cut the grass to some of the communities we go by. If we see a dirty park, these are all free things that we can offer our communities as we're doing our days. And I think that's also a part of financial literacy is learning some of those skills and bringing them home and saving money, you know, wherever you can. And I think that's going to build that long-term trust that may be hard for an investor to see today, but the community will see it from the very, very beginning because it's going to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think an important part of this, because a lot of community banks would argue it's like we represent in our communities, but it's different than having, you know, your logo on the, you know, high school football field or, you know, serving coffee, you know, at, you know, the county fair, you know, piece of this. Not that those aren't things to be done, but when you're talking about pulling a group that has opted out back into the system, that probably rings pretty hollow. Well, and it's about being an active participant in the community that you're trying to help. So when I talk to talk to tribal leaders about totem and I tell them, I get the first sentence out of my mouth. I say, we're the first digital bank buying four natives. And they say, oh, do you do financial literacy? Because we need that. I mean, that's literally the first thing that they think of. And so in addition to like being present, we're actually working on building partnerships with tribes to help them build out some of these financial literacy programs. And that is that's not something we make money on, right? That's something we're actually spending money on, spending time and capital on developing these programs. But it's so that we can take them into that community and get them receptive to the idea of digital banking and prepared to be a responsible bank account holder. And so ultimately, it does benefit us all. But you have to put in the work. You have to help cultivate the community that you're wanting to serve. And I also think it comes down to just them knowing the numbers. You know, like 7,000 invested at 18 is a million dollars at retirement if invested in, you know, a 7% return index fund. And if more of our people knew that in our community, you wouldn't have 66% not owning stocks. We're, so many people are just leaving out so many gateways of, of wealth just because they don't know any better. They don't know where to go to get them. They don't know how to buy the stocks. So I, I really think that part is also key, just financial literacy and just showing people where to go. And even if it isn't with the product that, you know, you're building, just you being a better person, a happier person is better for our communities long term. And I think that's really going to pay dividends with everyone. Although, Amber, you know you can't say financial literacy without me, you know, making throw up noises to it. Um, because I think financial literacy, you know, it, it's what people think they want but not what they use. You know, like I want to be skinnier and I want to eat a salad. <laughs> You know, let me let me tell you how the eating of the salad went down today, right? I managed to pick all of the good parts out and leave all of the kale still in there. And actually, Lola the dog finished the kale, um, right? But it's what we think we want. I think we have to drive deeper. And part of it comes into product design that you need people to eat healthy, but think that they're actually having chocolate chip cookies and what they're doing. Right. It's wrapping your dog's heartworm pill in bacon. Exactly. You, ha you have to do it in a way that, um, and, and I talk to people about this all the time because we have a lot of amazing Native American CDFIs or community development financial institutions, and they're doing a lot of this work on the ground. A lot of times it's training people so that they can participate in a home loan program or something like that, very specific. But like, I hate to say this, but no one wants to sit in a community center room for four hours on a Wednesday night and do a workbook. Like you just don't. No um, one ever wants to do a workbook. <laughs> That's the problem, right? Like give me yeah. the workbook. And, well, and it just doesn't stick if it's not immediately applicable to what you're doing in that moment. It's a lot harder to retain and put into practice that information that you're getting. And so you're right, Jason, it is all about designing the product in a way that those helpful nudges are embedded in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming or preachy, but that feels fun. Yeah, that was sort of our approach when building Obsidian. When we looked at the numbers and saw, like Demond said, 42% underbanked, 66% um, uninvested. It's like, how can we solve this without making it a bigger challenge for our demographic. And, you know, we we were initially looking at, you know, maybe we need to go try to build a full out investing platform for black people. And it's like, that's gonna complicate things more. Um, one thing we know our demographic does is spend money. We have, I think it's 1.3 trillion in spending, spending power right now. Our dollars stay in our communities about six hours on average as soon as, as soon as we get it. And so we're like, you know, the roundup feature can be a really, really, really great introduction to investing for, for us. So while we're trying to teach you, 
we can also have a service that says, hey, you don't need to change anything about your life. When you go swipe your card, it'll get invested. And then you'll get to see the benefits of investing as you're learning these things. And then that should, will hopefully, you know, make, make a person just be all in. And we also want to make it fun. So if you go swipe your card at Nike, let's buy Nike stock. You swipe your card at Nike enough, you get a whole Nike stock. And if you want to convert that Nike stock into a new pair of shoes, do it. And I think that's really what's going to make it fun. Like you're buying that Best Buy, you're buying Best Buy stock. You're shopping here. Like it, it makes you a part of the company. Like I'm spending money now with something I own a part of. And I, that's going to be the key, I think. Like I really, I'm really excited for people to get to really test that and try that. So the cost of acquisition and activation, only half of the ratio. How do we translate this into impacting the lifetime value, right? Because it really comes down to the ratio of your lifetime value to the cost per active customer is what makes the model go around. And I don't think enough neobanks have impacted that enough to make a sustainable business model. Um, Damon, why don't we start with you? Um, how do you think about where does your lifetime value come from? In the lifetime customers? value comes it comes from being able to get them different credit sources. I also agree. I don't think being a, a standard neo bank is going to be sustainable going forward. Too much competition, uh, too much going on. You have to be able to provide them the ability to get a car loan, the ability to get a home loan long term. Like make them feel to where they need to go nowhere else. Uh, there are some banks like SoFi is starting to approach that where they can get you everything. Um, I believe uh, Cash App is also starting to get you some of those options, but just having everything in the app that you would expect from a Bank of America. And I think that's how you convert that long-term value and you get them there for 60 years because no one wants to change their bank. No one wants to change their debit card numbers on all their accounts and change their routing numbers. So just get them stuck and they're stuck and just provide them a service and make them happy. Amber? I think we also have to, and you guys have talked about this with the investing piece, I think we have to do our part to raise the wealth in our communities so that they have the capacity to to participate in these higher level financial products, but also more spending power. I think, you know, that's why we're so pumped about helping people access their tribal benefits, because that's a source of wealth that is vastly un under tapped. Um, that's a lot of money that could be in the pockets of our people, um, giving them the power to, you know, instead of spend, instead of using our card for 20 transactions a month, maybe they can use it for 40. Right. And so we want to be growing with our customers and, um, not just providing them the more expensive products that are great for our bottom line, but something that is always going to be the next step. Um, our logo at Totem is kind of three, People say they look like rocks stacked on each other, but they kind that kind of is what <laughs> Jason's wearing the t-shirt now. The visual. <laughs> that's exactly what that that's exactly what was intended was that, you know, the first level, get a bank account, right? Okay. Step one, check. Next level, get your credit score, right? How do we build uh, all of these financial products on top of one another so that you are expanding as an individual while we're expanding as your provider as well? Well, and I want to tear into that for a second, because I think too often when we think about things like check cashing, why are they happy to see Stephen walk in versus the bank is because I know I'm going to charge you an awful lot, like an arm and a leg for that to cover my risk profile. And if I can manage the risk profile and you know losses versus what I bring in, of course, I'm happy. If we're talking about building products that are not predatory and have those things baked in. We're really talking about, Amber, you're stacking it, and I love the visual of it, is how do I extend the lifetime and make it a healthy long-term relationship as opposed to transactional in the short term, which is punitive through fees and other charges because you don't have minimum balances and overdrafts and things like that. Stephen and Damon, how do you think about, you know, from the lifetime value, are you looking to, do, you know, in making this ratio work, I either tremendously drop the CAC or do I extend the lifetime or do I increase the value? Where's the balance in how you, you pull those levers? Uh, dropping the CAC. Uh, we want to monetize the first point of contact with our customers. We're going on one of the most massive data collection events in Black history. We're going to over a million households in Black America. Um, the McKinsey report that's often referred to as, you know, a really great report only had 10,000. So we have a really good chance to take some of this data. We're going to get at some of our first point of contact and get it to some of our advertisers, some of the black you know, companies, find some of our weaknesses. So mm -hmm. that will allow us to, to decrease that cost at first point of contact. 
because other besides you know fintech banks have to wait until you sign up they have to grab you in you get you to sign into your bank account we don't need that we're having a conversation we have a script mm -hmm. how are you do you own this house do you rent this house we'll be able to take note notice of was their grass cut the type of car that they have we can ask them like hey are you satisfied with your you know your products you're buying and we can get a report and we can say, hey, the black community is missing X, Y, Z. You could be the guy that provides this or the woman that provides this to the community. And I think that's going to dramatically cut that down because that data is going to be so, so valuable. Mm. Absolutely. Well, we are just about out of time in show one, two, for the Obsidian team. How do people who want to connect either to partner or to learn more about working with you, where can they learn more? Um, you can find us um, at obsidianbanking.com. Our Instagram is at Obsidian Bank. Our Twitter is at Obsidian Bank. Um, LinkedIn, Obsidian Banking. Um, and then if there's any other communities that you know are inspired by our door-to-door -door approach and would love to, to partner, um, we'd love to come out because we think this could only benefit any community that, that utilizes this approach. Amber, how about finding out more about Totem? Well, first off, I want to get with y'all and uh, take a look at those business plans that you put together for teams to start businesses with less than a hundred dollars in capital. I thought that was so smart and cool. So like, we've got to hook up after this to talk about that. Um, but yeah, for, for everyone else, you can find me uh, at www.mytotem.app and we're also uh, at Bank with Totem uh, on Twitter pretty much. Don't look at our TikTok. We still don't have anything on it. Someday, someday I'll make that key higher <laughs> and get rolling on the TikToks, but native TikTok is huge. It's got 7.3 billion views on TikTok. So we'll be there eventually, but not today. Uh, so mm -hmm. at bank with totem on Twitter is a good way to find me. And, um, you can also just like email Jason and he'll, he'll connect you. <laughs> I'll connect you. And I will also plug go to provoke.fm and sort yes. by Amber. She has some phenomenal episodes, including, uh, talking to some other native leaders as they dive into this. Thank you all for joining me and talking about those who either opted out or never opted into the system and how we go build that trust. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. And we will definitely, definitely connect, Amber. We got a, we got something we want to talk to you about too. Okay. And, uh, Deal. All right. I'm we just get a cut. Our TikTok. <laughs> well, very excited to have you on and it, come about this for a very interesting way as we started actually with fintech islands is taking place uh very soon details will be in the show notes uh but it was a really interesting idea this idea of hey the caribbean needs a spotlight shined on it but it, this isn't just a island focus conference it is actually around how do we connect it to the big broader financial service and fintech ecosystem. And this is where Draper University comes in, which this is the space in which you play. And I'm going to guess that most of the listeners for Breaking Banks have probably not heard of Draper University. They're probably familiar with the name and thinking, wait a second, I know that, you know, that DFJ was, you know, a high flying ship in one of the most successful venture firms. You have some high profile partners from Silicon Valley icons. So talk to us about what is the mission of Draper University? Sure. So one thing I always like clearing out right away is that we're not a university. So we're not an accredited university. And we <laughs> there, are there is a, a certain you know, former university with large fines you know, uh -huh. attached to it that used the university label. Good, yeah. good disclaimer. So yeah, so we're not a university uh, or accredited university, and we are not an accelerator. Both of those models are kind of broken, and we talk about this a lot, like, oh, the university system doesn't work, or the accelerator model is kind of broken, very expensive. How do we do it? So we kind of play in this zone right in the middle. And so, yeah, so we're not a university, and we start with this mission that the world as we know it today is built. So we stand on the shoulders of giants or we stand on the shoulders of these like amazing 
entrepreneurial superheroes because anything great that you see today kind of went through this like it didn't happen overnight it went through this like story arc of very similar to what you would see like a greatest superhero going through and the world is built by these entrepreneurial superheroes and how do you kind of take them very early on because Silicon Valley is not a place it's a concept it's an idea it's a place where great people got access to capital and network. And that is something that there's like talent all over the world. I'm from Pakistan and I'm like amazing. So there's like amazing people all over the world, but what lacks in most of these um, ecosystems of these places is access to a network and access to capital, which really accelerates that initial growth. Mm -hmm. So that's what the Drip University is. It's a, it's a place where amazing entrepreneurs or people who are looking to start a company come together two or three times a year. Uh, we bought a hotel. Uh, we put everybody in that place. And it's like a pressure cooker of these amazing world changing ideas that are then combined with our network, which as you mentioned, we have one of the largest network in the Valley. And then we also have a fund on top of that, that then invests in the companies that come out of it. So we're in this like very interesting, we're not in the education space. We're not in the accelerator space, but we're kind of right in the middle in what we call the pre-accelerator. And what comes out of it is either amazing companies or people who get on these accelerated uh, career trajectories. And with that, we now have over 3,000 3, alumni in over 101 countries. So is it mainly individuals that come attend? What does the profile look like? Because that's a very intriguing stat in terms of the number of alumni you have and what they've gone on to do. Yeah. So I would say it's it's a mix. So the, the magic of this is that each cohort is some of these people, have, so it's 80 people, some of these people have companies that are already making millions. So they're just like kind of on that and they just need capital to grow um, okay. and need to hire people. Then there is a there is a batch in the middle or like a group of people in the middle that have ideas but are kind of like early. And then there is at least 20 people, every cohort who are, you know, who have no idea. They just want to build things. They feel very strongly either about a vertical or an, or a philosophical idea, but that's pretty much about it. And they have no idea what to build or what to do about it. So it's a great mix of people. And I think that's what makes it so special. And so I'd love to drill in a little bit deeper mm -hmm. on what is the curriculum like? Is it structured? And you also do some virtual on fundamentals of entrepreneurship. What are the different programs and options and what do you learn in each? Yeah. Um, so there is some method to the madness, but the cohort, the curriculum per se is designed based on what the cohort looks like each um, session, but we do have a basic skeleton. So the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, which is an online program that we do, is kind of just like a basic introduction to entrepreneurship. It's a cohort based model that we do um, six times a year and we bring in different industry experts, different people. And it's for, it's for individuals who want to, let's say, learn about what the hell is Web3 or, you know, what is AI? So it's like a basic introduction to uh, future tech and entrepreneurship. And then from there, we have on-site programs, which are more focused on essentially building uh, companies and growing companies. So that's um, how it works. And aside from that, so those are our two flagship programs. And then we work with our own um, ecosystem, our own, the companies within our portfolio to also run accelerators and capacity building programs throughout the year. And so this is like a global ecosystem when you look at, well, you actually call it the Draper ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What are the pieces of the ecosystem? Where do they reside globally? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So for us, I think if you think about us, um, the easiest way to think about it is as a funnel. So top of funnel is where we have a lot of these, like, you know, this, what we call discovery or how we kind of hmm. get in front of people. So we have two things there. One is Draper Startup Houses, which are these um, cool working, cool living spaces across the world. I think we, we're now at 
um, 20 plus of these spaces. And these are just for people, young individuals who just want to kind of come together, work in a space, learn more about entrepreneurship. And then they are connected with the Draper University education portfolio. So what we then do is we offer these collaborative programs that uh, give them access to our capital and network. And then Draper University has alumni in 101 countries. We work with over 37 different governments. And the purpose of all of that is to really cater to the stop of funnel and get more people interested in technology and either building things or joining our companies that are building. So that's kind of top of funnel. So then, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. So then we have funds. So um, I manage a fund, which is a early stage fund that invests anywhere from 25 to 100,000. So we're kind of like the first check fund. But then we have over 20 funds in our ecosystem. Tim Draper manages Draper Associates, which is a $250 million fund. Uh, but then we have early stage to late stage funds across the globe that fall under the Draper um network, Draper Venture Network. And these funds uh, work with each other on deal flow. And that's kind of how the funnel works. So it's like pretty, uh, and again, everything kind of works with each other as well while we're at it. So we kind of have education, discovery at the top, and then venture capital um, at the bottom of the funnel. Interesting that you curate and you basically mature your own funnel so mm -hmm. that you know you've kind of brought it into your perspective from the the very beginning yeah that's exactly the idea and when you look at the areas to focus and you look at on a global basis where do you see kind of the next wave coming in terms of unmet opportunity that you say you know i loved your phrase that silicon valley is a concept not just a location where do you view, and I'm almost hesitant to say it because it's been overused, kind of the next Silicon Valley, but from a mentality, not a geography point of view per se, that say, you know, is it, you know, the parts of Africa or India, where do you think some of these opportunities are, you know, really beginning to take flight? I think the crux of it is still going to be, like, I'm a big, like, I love America. And I think that is still going to be the place where a lot of this innovation happens. And a lot of things that truly change uh, the landscape or like new paradigms are created, that's still going to be in within the US. Uh, but outside of that, the big markets where we're seeing a lot more opportunity, especially in terms of fintech or services, Latin America is huge. That's where a lot of things are happening. And again, mm -hmm. a lot of these models that, um, because there is a huge, um, so growing up in Pakistan, there's a huge services gap, right? So anywhere where the quality of service is really low and the price of the service is really high is where your big opportunity is, right? So markets like India or markets like um, more developed parts of, because Africa is a big continent, so I don't want to lump Yeah, you can't it lump it in all at once, Not right? At like Africa is very different. Yeah. yeah, but then markets like Kenya, which are kind of like, you know, doing, uh, already developing that technical infrastructure or, um uh, Ghana, etc. So those are doing great. Middle East, North Africa is a great consumer market. So uh, Middle East is like great for sales and services. So any services, service models or these like models that you want to test, that's where that is. Uh, so I think these markets are ripe for a lot of these um, service or like fin especially uh, we've uh two of our unicorns from our uh, so from my fund one of them is essentially a crypto company in uh started in chile argentina and um is now growing so i think fintech is a huge kind of vertical within that but these are again big markets where a lot of these models that are kind of already um operational are going to scale because everybody has access to a phone now Yes. Now, I'd love to hear some perspective since you have such an interesting global one that you know, one of the problems when you look at the US and when you look at Europe is we have embedded infrastructure that is good enough. It's no longer great, mm -hmm. right? But it's good enough. And you now talked about, you know, now everyone has a phone and you're seeing this opportunity to leapfrog. Are you mm -hmm. finding in some of these developing countries just new, because they don't have an incumbent 
you know, infrastructure. They don't have the large incumbent players. They don't have the incumbent business models. Are they able to, you know, reinvent financial services in a way that when you have good enough, you actually can't do, you're not starting with a, you know, clean you know, piece of paper. Yeah. So I, okay, let me answer that question in another, like slightly. So in another way, so a lot of these countries, for example, let's use Pakistan's example, right? Pakistan doesn't have basic, like a lot of basic infrastructures missing. If you want to send money, it's a pain in the butt behind. And a lot of government controls how um, this infrastructure is going to take place, right? The government can decide to block um, all internet connectivity because there's a political riot or there is not even basic, um, let's say there's no electricity, um, on the hour, every hour for six months out of the year, yep. right? So the operational cost of doing those things is really, really high. So while a lot of these, um, I think there are some governments that are taking the incentive to actually bring that foreign capital into the market. One of the biggest things that we uh, kind of always disregard about the US in this conversation is the freedom of doing business. Mm. The Yes. And that is what really drives innovation. And that is what really drives this like, uh, like people, their willingness to work. And that's still why a lot of people, regardless of how much capital flows into these local markets, the talent at the top still wants to move to the US. It's for that you know, it's not for the the nice roads. Like I love the big roads in Texas, but it's for that freedom, for that, you know, the, that freedom of movement, that freedom of thought that then gives you more opportunity in your head. That's like, you know, kind of your head is empty. And then you can really think about things that you problems that you want to solve. And there is some infrastructure and risk capital available for that. Well, so it, that risk capital in particular is very resident here. Yeah. So it's like a multi-tiered thing. It's not just something that, oh, a government can turn on a switch or turn off a switch and, you know, build better infrastructure that would enable them to innovate. It's a lot of other things as well. So let's talk about FinTech Islands and what you're setting up there. Back to you know, where we started here with, you know, FinTech Islands bringing a spotlight to the Caribbean, which I think we it is at such a crossroads between North America, South America, but also a rich history connecting, you know, to Africa and to Europe. Talk to us about what Draper is going to be doing at FinTech Islands. Yeah, so again, for us, I think one of the, Talent is everywhere in the world, and we really want to be at the forefront of get having access to that talent and being that first kind of brand that comes to mind whenever you're thinking of building something. And with our fintech portfolio, I think Ribbon is a great market to be in. And one of the things we want to do is, again, have a Draper Startup House, which is a co-working, co-living space where people who are interested in these technologies can come together. And then with Draper University, have access to not just the network or not just mentors, but also have access to capital that kind of goes into building some of these um, technologies that they're thinking about. And so what kind of programming is going to take place? In, is it actually going to be a physical house? Um, we do have a physical house in uh, the Caribbean, and we're looking to do uh, at least one or two more of those. So these are actual physical spaces. Okay. I love the combination between physical and like the virtual in terms of the amount of access it can create. I'm yeah. curious, how do you replicate, you know, given just how big the network is and how vast the reach is and how varied the needs are, what is the online experience like to be part of Draper University? Yeah. So when we do the online experience, it's not purely online. We try, okay. we try our best to do a hybrid because uh, the best learning comes from being in the same room with five or six other people that you're discussing ideas with or kind of arguing with or learning from. So what we didn't do is we used Draper Startup House Spaces to run these hybrid programs. So you can do a program completely online or you could go to a Draper Startup House Space and take a Draper University program. And what that does is that that then uh, gets you kind of, you know, incubated into this larger ecosystem within your region and also kind of helps us uh, 
just be more effective. And then online, what we do is that we do a whole bunch of different, um, so we've kind of developed these co- like smaller cohorts, okay. depending on time zones that then interact with each other more one-on-one. And then we bring in uh, experts who also then interact with them one-on-one. So we try to keep do a lot more one-on-one activity, even when we're online, to really make it uh, efficient and effective. Now, can, we're almost out of time, but I'd love to hear some of the outcomes that have been achieved. You know, What can you share so far in terms of the results that you've seen of this effort? So with Draper University, uh, we now have 3,100 alumni, and they've gone on to build about 325 companies uh, at last count. They've raised north of 900 million in venture funding. We have six unicorns in the last, we're now in our 10th year, and um, only two of them are U.S., so the rest of them are international. And uh, not just that, I think one stat that I am the proudest of is that on average, each one of our alumni creates five to six new jobs in the market. And that is what really kind of, you know, adds to that. Because for me, there's no freedom without like financial freedom. And Mm -hmm. that adds to that financial freedom and financial growth for the market that they're coming into. And I think they take back the same kind of that Silicon Valley mindset back to the countries that they come from and build those systems there, be those, they work in governments, they work in other startups, they work for our portfolio companies. And we've really seen this like kind of grow as network effects with it. That's phenomenal. Now, you also have some superstars that surround and support um, Draper University. Who are some of the notable notable names that are behind this in addition to the Draper name? So um, every cohort, we get... um, phenomenal people who are more than happy to come back. And so we've had founders of Airbnb, um, Salesforce, uh, you know, top engineering talent from uh, all the fame companies. So it's built, I think we do just the infrastructure piece and the operations piece, but it's truly built by people who are, who are happy to not only uh, who are happy to sponsor cohorts, but also give their time and really work with founders. So uh, every single person in our network has at least in some way or form, uh, shape or form touched Draper University. Fantastic. Well, if anyone is looking to get a taste of what uh, can be brought to bear by Draper University and the FinTech House should consider attending FinTech Islands coming up in October, starting October 5th. Some phenomenal um, speakers. The tracks are around how do you decentralize finance? How do we promote currency fluency? The idea of blue ocean around green money, finteching the unbanked and embedded finance. And they've put together for a first year program just a phenomenal set of speakers. And would highly encourage anyone who's interested in getting uh, to Barbados should definitely consider attending. And thank you so much for taking the time to share the mission of Draper University with me. Of course. And please do attend. Um, You'll learn a lot and it's going to be an awesome party. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more breaking banks.